Welcome to this presentation on the Bank Secrecy Act. We'll also cover important aspects of anti-money laundering and the Office of Foreign Assets Control Requirements. Throughout this video, we'll refer to these areas as BSA, AML, and OFAC. We'll focus on what you, as a director, should know about these areas. We'll begin by providing an overview of the BSA and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network's role in safeguarding the financial system. We will discuss BSA regulatory requirements for depository institutions and touch on the FDIC's examination process. Additionally, we'll cover the elements of an effective OFAC sanctions compliance program. The Bank Secrecy Act is the common name for a series of laws and regulations to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. The BSA provides a foundation to promote financial transparency and to deter and detect those who attempt to misuse the U.S. financial system to launder funds or finance terrorist acts. The BSA has evolved over the last 50 years, with several laws impacting regulatory requirements. One of the most recent pieces of legislation is the USA Patriot Act. These laws have resulted in regulations that require banks to establish and maintain BSA compliance programs. Provisions of the BSA cover traditional depository institutions such as banks, savings associations, and credit unions. The BSA also applies to non-bank financial institutions such as securities and commodities firms, loan or finance companies, money service businesses, insurance companies, casinos, and dealers in precious metals, stones, and jewels. For purposes of this presentation, we will focus on BSA and AML requirements as they relate to depository institutions. The Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, referred to as FinCEN, is a bureau of the U.S. Department of the Treasury. FinCEN is designated the administrator of the BSA. In this role, it has been authorized to implement, administer, and enforce compliance with the BSA and its associated regulations. FinCEN is also the U.S. Financial Intelligence Unit. In this role, it collects data related to money laundering and terrorist financing, analyzes it for trends and patterns, and disseminates information to law enforcement and other government agencies. FinCEN issues regulation and guidance, communicates with regulated industries, supports examination functions, and pursues civil enforcement actions. Importantly, FinCEN has delegated much of its examination authority to regulatory agencies, including the FDIC. Now that we've covered some BSA background, we'd like to focus on BSA-related regulatory requirements for banks. As a bank director, you are responsible for ensuring that your bank has an effective, risk-based BSA AML compliance program. This is accomplished by approving written policies and procedures, providing sufficient resources and knowledgeable BSA AML personnel, and assessing ongoing program compliance. The Board of Directors should create a culture of compliance by setting the tone at the top to ensure staff understands the importance of and adheres to the bank's BSA AML policies, procedures, and processes. The BSA AML compliance program should be commensurate with the bank's overall risk profile and based on a comprehensive assessment of money laundering and terrorist financing risks. A bank's risk profile is based on its products, services, customers, entities, transactions, and geographic locations. In other words, as a bank's risk profile increases or decreases, its BSA AML compliance program should be adjusted. So a comprehensive risk assessment is the starting point for an appropriate BSA AML compliance program. A well-developed risk assessment should factor in the types of products and services offered, the customer base, and the geography served. The risk assessment should include all branches and operational areas. The same risk management principles that the bank uses in traditional operational areas should be applied to assessing and managing money laundering and terrorist financing risk. The bank's risk assessment is not intended to be a static process. 
As a matter of sound practice, a bank should review its risk assessment periodically and update it to account for any changes in the bank's risk profile. For example, management should update the risk assessment when new products and services are offered or there is a change in the bank's operations such as expansion through merger or branching activities. The risk assessment should be presented to the board for approval since it is the foundation for developing appropriate policies, procedures, systems, and controls in relation to the bank's risk profile. As a director, you are responsible for ensuring that the bank has an effective, risk-based BSA AML compliance program. So now, let's discuss the key components that are required to be included in a BSA AML compliance program. The six components that every bank's BSA AML compliance program must have are a system of internal controls, independent testing of the program's effectiveness, a designated individual to manage the program, training for appropriate personnel, an established customer identification program, and procedures for customer due diligence. For the next few minutes, we'll discuss each of these components. Let's start with the internal control system. A system of internal controls consists of policies, procedures, and processes that management uses to manage, monitor, and control money laundering and terrorist financing risks. Internal controls should be designed to assist in ongoing compliance with BSA AML regulations. Policies and procedures should address suspicious activity monitoring and FinCEN reporting and record keeping requirements, which we'll discuss later. A BSA AML compliance program must be periodically assessed to determine its effectiveness, which brings us to the independent testing component. As a director, it's critical that the board ensure that an independent party performs periodic testing. To meet that standard of independence, management can assign an employee who is not involved in day-to-day -day BSA duties, hire an outside party who does not already consult on the bank's BSA AML compliance program, or establish an arrangement with another bank. In addition, that independent party must be qualified. In other words, the person performing the independent testing needs to have sufficient BSA AML knowledge for the complexity of the bank's activities. The scope and frequency of the independent testing should be commensurate with the bank's risk profile. The testing performed should assist the board in determining whether the program it has adopted is effective. In other words, are there areas of weakness or areas in need of stronger controls? As a director, you need to ensure that the results from the independent review are provided directly to the board or a designated board committee and that appropriate actions are taken to address the findings. Now, we'll cover the responsibilities for providing necessary resources and personnel to coordinate and monitor BSA AML compliance. This is accomplished by designating an individual to manage the program. Although the Board of Directors is not responsible for day-to-day -day oversight, it retains ultimate responsibility for BSA AML compliance. Therefore, the Board must designate a qualified individual responsible for coordinating and monitoring BSA AML compliance. The designated individual is commonly referred to as the BSA officer. This person must understand BSA requirements, have sufficient authority to develop and enforce board-approved policies, and have appropriate staff and resources to effectively administer the BSA AML compliance program. Let's move on to the training component. Training should include regulatory and statutory requirements and cover the bank's internal BSA AML policies, procedures, and processes. Training must be provided to all personnel whose duties require knowledge of the BSA and should be tailored to the employee's specific job responsibilities. The BSA officer should also receive training that is appropriate for coordinating and monitoring BSA AML compliance given the bank's activities and risk profile. Further, as a director, you should receive periodic training to reinforce BSA concepts and stay informed of developments in the BSA. All training should be documented. 
It should be conducted on an ongoing basis to reinforce compliance responsibilities and cover changes to the BSA. Moving on, we'll now take a moment to discuss the Customer Identification Program, or CIP. The purpose of a CIP is to enable a bank to form a reasonable belief of the true identity of the bank's customers. This will mitigate the risk that the institution will be used as a conduit for money laundering and terrorist financing. The Customer Identification Program must be written and include account opening procedures and customer identification and verification methods. The final component of a bank's BSA AML compliance program is implementation of the Customer Due Diligence or CDD component. Banks have been performing customer due diligence for many years. FinCEN issued regulations requiring banks to perform ongoing CDD and to identify and verify beneficial owners of a legal entity customer. First, let's talk about ongoing CDD. The BSA AML Compliance Program must include appropriate risk-based procedures for conducting ongoing CDD. Procedures must be designed to understand the nature and purpose of customer relationships to develop customer risk profiles. Additionally, the procedures must provide for ongoing monitoring to identify and report suspicious activity and to maintain and update customer information on a risk basis. CDD, in essence, is understanding the nature and purpose of customer relationships. This process starts when a new customer first approaches the bank. Customers should provide details on the proposed level and types of transactions. For example, the bank should know if a business is cash intensive or if a customer plans to perform international wire transfers. Information gathered should assist management in determining whether activities and transactions make sense. Now, let's move on to beneficial ownership requirements. Banks are required to establish written beneficial ownership procedures. Under the beneficial ownership rule, banks must identify and verify the identity of a single individual with significant responsibility to control, manage, or direct a legal entity customer. Banks must also identify and verify the identity of each individual, if any, who owns 25% or more of that legal entity customer. Let's talk for a minute about what we mean by legal entity customers. For purposes of the beneficial ownership rule, a legal entity customer is a corporation, limited liability company, or other entity created by the filing of a public document with the Secretary of State or similar office under domestic or foreign law. A bank may rely on the identifying information for the beneficial owners as long as the person opening the account certifies the accuracy of the information. The bank must also have no knowledge of facts that would reasonably call into question the information's reliability. Beneficial ownership requirements apply to new accounts opened after May 11, 2018. Although the beneficial ownership requirements do not apply retroactively, Beneficial ownership information may need to be updated for existing legal entity customers based on the bank's ongoing monitoring. We have just covered the six components that must be present for you as a director to meet your responsibilities for ensuring that the bank has an effective risk-based BSA AML compliance program. The Bank Secrecy Act also establishes other regulatory requirements pertaining to suspicious activity monitoring and reporting, currency transaction reporting, and record-keeping requirements. First, we will discuss suspicious activity monitoring and reporting. Banks have a responsibility to monitor, identify, and report suspicious activities. If a bank becomes aware of an unusual or suspicious activity or transaction, bank staff must investigate further and determine whether a suspicious activity report, referred to as a SAR, should be filed. A bank is not responsible for finding evidence of or proving an underlying crime. Banks are required to file a SAR when they detect known or suspected federal criminal violations involving transactions indicating insider abuse in any amount, aggregating $5,000 or more when a suspect can be identified, 
aggregating $25,000 or more, regardless of a potential suspect, aggregating $5,000 or more that may involve potential money laundering or violations of the BSA, or that have no apparent lawful purpose. Suspicious activity monitoring and reporting processes are critical internal controls. As part of its overall responsibility for ensuring the bank has an effective, risk-based BSA AML compliance program, the board should approve policy guidelines that address transaction monitoring, alert management, suspicious activity investigations, SAR filing decisions, and ongoing suspicious activities. FinCEN and the federal banking agencies recognize that as a practical matter, it is not possible for a bank to detect and report all potentially illicit transactions that flow through the bank. Accordingly, examiners' focus will be on evaluating the bank's policies, procedures, and processes to identify, evaluate, and report suspicious activity. The board should provide adequate resources to ensure that suspicious activities are appropriately identified, researched, and reported, taking into account the bank's overall risk profile and the volume of transactions. We want to spend a few minutes talking more about effective monitoring and reporting systems. There are five key components to an effective system. The first component is identification or alert of unusual activity. Alerts may come from a teller processing a suspected structured transaction, law enforcement inquiries, or the review of internal monitoring reports. Alerts can also be generated from a transaction-based system. The second component is managing alerts, which focus on processes used to investigate and evaluate unusual activity. Management should establish a defined process from the point of the initial alert or detection to the disposition of the investigation. The third component is SAR decision-making. After the bank researches and analyzes the unusual activity, someone at the bank, either an individual or a committee, makes a final decision on whether to file a SAR. The decision-maker should have the authority to make the final SAR filing decision. Banks should document SAR decisions, including the specific reason for filing or not filing a SAR. The fourth component is SAR completion and filing. These are critical parts of the SAR monitoring and reporting process. Procedures should be in place to ensure SARs are filed in a timely manner, are complete and accurate, and that the narrative provides sufficient description of the activity reported, as well as the basis for filing. The fifth and final component is monitoring and SAR filing on continuing activity. The bank should have procedures that outline how it will monitor future activity in the account and address recurring SAR filings. The procedures should include an escalation process for review of the identified accounts, including a recommendation if such accounts and relationships should be maintained or closed. It's important to note that all banks should have a monitoring system addressing these components. The board should make sure that policies, procedures, and processes clearly describe the steps that the bank takes to identify, monitor, and report suspicious activity. But, to be clear, the structure and formality of the components will vary. We've just covered the five elements of an effective suspicious activity monitoring program. Let's talk more about the board's role in SAR filings. Established policies should address board notification of SAR filings. Management is not required to provide actual copies of SARs to the board. However, the board or a committee of the board must be promptly notified of SAR filings. It is critical that management provide sufficient information on SAR filings to the board so that board members can fulfill fiduciary duties to the bank while being mindful of the confidential nature of the SAR. Generally, the board should expect to receive information on SAR filings to make informed decisions. This may include details on the number of SARs and the type of suspicious activities. The board should also have knowledge of potential illegal activities in the bank's customer base. For example, if a SAR had been filed on a large loan customer that was applying for a new loan, the board would likely need this information to make an informed decision on whether or not to extend additional credit. 
SARS are confidential and cannot be shared outside the institution or disclosed to the suspect. However, under guidance issued by FinCEN, SARS may be shared with the bank's parent entity. External requests for SARS, including subpoenas, should be reported to the bank's regulatory agency and FinCEN. Let's now spend a minute talking about other BSA reporting and record keeping requirements. In addition to SARS, banks are also required to submit other reports to FinCEN, including currency transaction reports, also referred to as CTRs, and designations of exempt person forms. Banks are required to file CTRs for cash transactions over $10,000. CTRs must be filed electronically with FinCEN within 15 calendar days of the transactions. Banks may exempt some customers from the filing of CTRs under specific conditions and circumstances. When a bank chooses to exempt a customer from CTR filings, the institution must file a form with FinCEN. Now that we've talked about the bank's role in identifying and filing required reports with FinCEN, let's talk about what FinCEN does with this information. FinCEN receives BSA reports daily from a wide range of bank and non-bank financial institutions and analyzes the data to identify individuals, entities, criminal organizations, and techniques involved in money laundering, terrorism financing, along with other illicit activities. Information in the filings can be used to connect seemingly unrelated individuals and entities across the country and around the world. SARS and CTRs are the primary means for law enforcement to acquire information on financial transactions. This reporting has been instrumental in successful criminal investigations. SARS filed by a bank can be combined with SARS filed by other institutions to link complex criminal activities. As a director, remember that a SAR, no matter how minor it may seem, may be part of a bigger puzzle that is being put together by FinCEN and law enforcement. We want to show you how that works and how SAR filings can play an important role in criminal investigations. We are going to walk through an example based on an actual case, although the names and other identifying facts in the case have been changed. Law enforcement suspected that a company which we will call Bad Drug Company, was involved in a drug trafficking operation. As part of their investigation, they were tracking a suspect that was known to be using multiple aliases. It took numerous SARs that were filed by several banks for law enforcement to put the puzzle together. Bank A filed a SAR on EZ Convenience Mart for suspected structuring due to multiple cash deposits just under $10,000 made on the same day that appeared to be designed to evade reporting requirements. Additionally, the deposits did not appear to have a lawful business purpose based on the bank's Customer Due Diligence, or CDD, of the business. Joe Charles was also listed as a suspect and was the registered owner of Easy Convenience Mart. Bank B filed a SAR on EZ Convenience Mart for unexplained multiple wire transfers to Charles Smith at Bank D. Chuck Joseph was also listed as a suspect and was an authorized signer on EZ Convenience Mart's account. Bank C filed a SAR naming Jan Smith as a suspect for structuring due to multiple cash deposits just under $10,000 designed to evade reporting requirements. Jan stated that the cash was from winnings at the casino. Shortly after the cash was deposited, Jan wired the funds to Charles Smith account at Bank D. Jan reported that Charles Smith was her brother who lives out of state. Bank D filed a SAR naming Charles Smith as a suspect for receiving multiple large money orders and wire transfers from Bank A, Bank B, and Bank C. Based on the bank's CDD of Charles Smith, the deposits and outgoing withdrawals had no apparent lawful purpose. Monthly, Charles Smith wired a large amount of money to Joe Charles Smith's account at Bank of Anytown. Bank of Anytown filed a SAR naming Joe Charles Smith as a suspect for sending large international wire transactions to Bad Drug Company's account at Foreign Bank E. The source of funds for the outgoing wires was monthly wires from Charles Smith at Bank D. 
Based on the bank's CDD of Joe Charles Smith, the incoming and outgoing wires had no apparent lawful purpose. To summarize, five banks filed SARS. All five SARS named different suspects. However, the names were very similar, and in four of the five SARS, the suspects had the same date of birth and social security number. The SAR for Bank C is not linked by date of birth or social security number, but there is activity tied to an individual at Bank D. When Bank of Anytown filed the SAR, law enforcement was able to tie all the activity together and link the bad actors to bad drug company. Without the SAR filed by Bank of Anytown, law enforcement would not have had all the pieces to the puzzle. Law enforcement was able to shut down bad drug company. Suspicious transactions at your bank may only be one piece of a larger puzzle. Law enforcement agencies use SARS to identify financial links to illicit activity. These agencies supplement ongoing investigations by analyzing FinCEN's database for name matches to existing suspects and their known associates. Law enforcement agencies frequently use SARS to generate new leads and determine whether to open new cases. We'd like to touch on one final point relating to BSA reporting. Since CTR and SAR filings are so useful to law enforcement, the BSA's record-keeping regulations require that banks maintain financial records and provide information to law enforcement upon request. Generally, all reports filed under the BSA and the related financial records must be maintained for a period of five years, typically from the date of the transaction or from the date of the account closure. Now, let's change gears and talk about BSA examination procedures. During each safety and soundness examination, the FDIC evaluates the bank's compliance with the BSA and its implementing regulations. Examiners assess the appropriateness of the bank's program in relation to its risk profile. They begin this process with a review of the risk assessment and the bank's written policies, procedures, and processes. The BSA examination is focused on an evaluation of the BSA AML compliance program that we discussed earlier. The FDIC uses a risk-based approach to assess BSA AML compliance. Examination results requiring bank follow-up may range from minor technical issues to significant compliance deficiencies. Examination findings and recommendations will be discussed verbally throughout the entire examination process and be included in the final written report of examination. The written report of examination is the principal document of record by which examination findings and conclusions are communicated to the bank. Let's spend a few minutes discussing where BSA findings and recommendations may be presented in the report of examination. Discussion of minor technical issues may be limited to supporting report of examination schedules, such as on the Violations of Laws and Regulations page or the Risk Management Assessment page. The FDIC will communicate recommended corrective action for minor technical issues as supervisory recommendations to the bank. These recommendations are intended to inform the bank of the FDIC's views about changes needed in the bank's BSA AML practices or operations. A principal purpose is to communicate supervisory concerns so the bank can make appropriate changes and thereby avoid more formal remedies in the future. Discussion of significant compliance deficiencies appears on several pages of the report of examination. They are communicated at the beginning of the report of examination on the Matters Requiring Board Attention, or MERBA, page. When bank management promptly takes action to address concerns detailed in MERBAs, potential problems can be fixed early before they become more difficult to address. Significant compliance deficiencies will also be discussed in more detail on the Examination Conclusions and Comments page. They will further be addressed on the Violations of Laws and Regulations page. Significant compliance deficiencies relate to a failure to provide an effective BSA AML compliance program, meaning there are deficiencies in one or more of the required program components. 
We would now like to provide more detail about significant apparent violations that relate to program components. Significant apparent violations relate to a pattern or practice of noncompliance with the BSA and its implementing regulations. To be clear, significant apparent violations are not isolated or technical issues. Violations of the internal control component may be cited when systems are lacking or ineffective or if the bank has failed to follow its own internal control procedures. An apparent violation for the independent testing component could occur when an independent review has not been completed within a reasonable time frame based on the bank's risk profile, the reviewer is not independent or qualified, or when the review itself is ineffective. Violations of the BSA officer component commonly result when the board has not appointed a BSA officer, the designated individual lacks necessary authority, or the BSA officer does not have the expertise or resources to adequately perform the job. An apparent violation of the training component could occur when a bank doesn't maintain sufficient training records, the training is inadequate, or the training is not effective, resulting in significant weaknesses in internal controls. Violations of the CDD component may result when an institution has not adequately determined a customer's risk profile, resulting in ineffective suspicious activity monitoring. In addition to citing apparent violations for deficiencies in individual program components, the FDIC may also cite an overall BSA AML compliance program failure. When the FDIC does find significant issues with BSA compliance, enforcement actions can result. Let's briefly discuss this. Enforcement actions can be informal, such as a board resolution or memorandum of understanding, or formal, such as a cease and desist or consent order. Directors need to understand that BSA AML compliance is a critical risk management function. It is important that the Board of Directors ensures prompt correction of significant deficiencies related to a BSA AML program component. Existing statute requires the FDIC and the other federal banking agencies to take formal enforcement action in response to a BSA AML compliance program failure. Additionally, existing statute requires a formal enforcement action be issued in response to repeat compliance program deficiencies. Before we move on, we want to emphasize that the vast majority of FDIC-supervised institutions are successful in complying with the BSA. We recognize the resources that banks expend to comply with the BSA, and, to be clear, most banks have sound BSA AML compliance programs. Historically, less than 1% of the BSA examinations that the FDIC performs in a year results in a formal enforcement action. Lastly we would like to take a moment to discuss the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, Economic and Trade-Based Sanctions Programs. OFAC administers and enforces economic and trade sanctions based on U.S. foreign policy objectives. Although OFAC requirements are separate and distinct from the BSA, banks are also required to comply with OFAC-sanctioned programs which share a common national security goal. For this reason, many banks view compliance with OFAC sanctions as related to BSA compliance obligations. Similar to BSA compliance, it is important for the Board of Directors to understand the risks and controls necessary for OFAC compliance. OFAC sanctioned programs require that a bank either block accounts and other property or prohibit or reject unlicensed trade and financial transactions. All U.S. persons, including U.S. banks and their foreign branches, bank holding companies, and non-bank subsidiaries must comply with these sanctions. Many banks achieve this by maintaining a written OFAC compliance program that is commensurate with the bank's risk profile. Just as with the BSA AML compliance program, a risk assessment is a key link for developing an effective OFAC compliance program. A risk-based OFAC compliance program should provide for appropriate internal controls for screening and reporting transactions and account information, 
designate an employee responsible for OFAC compliance, implement training programs for appropriate personnel, and establish independent testing for OFAC compliance. BSA AML compliance programs are integral elements in the prevention and detection of bad actors seeking to misuse the financial system. Banks should take reasonable and prudent steps to combat money laundering and terrorist financing and to minimize their vulnerability to the risk associated with such activities. The FDIC recognizes the challenges and costs associated with BSA AML compliance. This is especially true as criminal organizations and terrorist financiers use creative and increasingly sophisticated methods to misuse the financial system. The vast majority of FDIC-supervised institutions are successful in complying with the BSA and play an important role in promoting public confidence and stability in the financial system. Directors cannot adequately carry out their fiduciary duties without a general understanding of BSA, AML, and OFAC regulatory requirements. To summarize, the Board of Directors should understand the importance of BSA, AML, and OFAC, the consequences of not complying, and the risks posed to the bank. As with other areas of bank operations, the Board should request and receive regular reports on the bank's compliance with BSA, AML, and OVAC requirements. There are many other sources of information available to further supplement your knowledge of BSA, AML, and OFAC. For additional regulatory information, please refer to FDIC Rules and Regulations, Section 326.8, Bank Secrecy Act Compliance. FDIC Rules and Regulations, Part 353, Suspicious Activity Reports. Title 31, Chapter Roman Numeral 10, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. FFIEC, Bank Secrecy Act Anti-Money Laundering Examination Manual. You may also refer to the following websites for more information. www.fdic.gov www.fincen.gov www.treasury.gov slash OFAC Additionally, each FDIC regional office has a designated BSA specialist that is available to answer BSA, AML, and OFAC-related questions. The bank's case manager can provide you contact information. As we conclude, We'd like to thank you for viewing this presentation and remind you that this video is part of the FDIC's Technical Assistance Video Program. Other videos can be found at www.fdic.gov slash resource center. If you have questions or comments regarding this video, please email the FDIC at supervision at fdic.gov.